Today, this ancient aeroplane sits quietly in its purpose-built hangar, not far from the control tower at Adelaide Airport. The Vickers Vimy, designed by 26-year-old Rex Pearson, was constructed during the latter days of World War I, designed to be a heavy bomber. Rex had lost a brother early in the war, and designed the plane to be safe as well as efficient. The war came to an end before it could be used for its intended role. Instead, it became the first plane to fly the kangaroo route, from Britain to Australia, which at the time was the longest flight ever made, estimated to be between 11,123 and 11,294 miles. The Australian Government in April 1919 offered a £10,000 prize for an Australian aircrew flying a craft of British manufacture to be completed within 30 days and before the 31st of December 1920. The route was from Hounslow Heath in London to Alexandria and Singapore and onto the finish line at Darwin. A £100 deposit to be paid to enter. The Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, believed that aviation had the potential to unite the British Empire as never before and saw it as a means to inspire Australia in the wake of the devastating effects of the Great War on the population. Out of a male population of two and a half million, over 60,000 had been killed and many others changed forever by their experiences. The offer was taken up by six crews, four of them led by South Australians. A Sopwith Wallaby flown by Captain George Matthews was the first aloft. Matthews flew out on the morning of the 21st of October 1919. Unfortunately, Matthews and his offsider Sergeant K were arrested as suspected Bolsheviks in Yugoslavia and lost valuable time. They very nearly made it all the way, but crash-landed in Bali, Indonesia on the 17th of April 1920, long after the prize had been won anyway. The Vickers Vimy, crewed by brothers Ross and Keith Smith, with mechanics Sergeants Shears and Bennett, were the second to take to the sky, leaving on the 12th of November 1919. Captain Ross Smith had served in Gallipoli before volunteering for the Flying Corps in 1917. He became an air ace and was Lawrence of Arabia's pilot. Keith Smith was rejected for service as medically unfit, but paid his own fare to England and joined the Royal Flying Corps in 1917. He did not see any action during his time in the military. The next day, 13th of November 1919, an Alliance P-2 Seabird flown by Lieutenants Douglas and Ross took off, but didn't even get out of the London area before they crashed into an orchard in Surbiton, six miles from Hounslow. Both men died as a result of the accident. They had been considered the most likely team to battle it out with a Vimy to reach Darwin first. The fourth group of competitors, including another famous South Australian pilot, Captain Hubert Wilkins, joined the race on the 21st of November in a Blackburn kangaroo. They experienced mechanical difficulties which forced them down in France and then caused them to crash land in Crete on the 8th of December, ending their bid. Although the fifth plane, a Martinside Type A, flown by Captain Howell and Lieutenant Fraser, didn't take off until the 5th of December, they had almost caught up to the Blackburn when their luck too ran out. On the 9th of December, they crashed off Corfu. Howell's body was recovered, but Fraser's was never found. The sixth competitor didn't even leave until after the prize had been won. Lieutenant Ray Parra, who earned the nickname Battling Ray, and his co-pilot Lieutenant John McIntosh left England on the 8th of January 1920 in their Airco DH-9 and took 206 days to make the journey. But they were the only other crew to finish the race, and they were the first to complete the journey in a single-engined machine. They touched down on the 2nd of August 1920. For their efforts, the government awarded them a consolation prize of £1,000. Like the Vimy, the Air Co was restored and is on display at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. There was a seventh unofficial competitor. There was some dissent that the Australian government should have allowed anyone to enter the race and given the Australians a go for it. A French pilot named Etienne Poulet declared that he would be the first to fly from Europe to Australia in his own plane without any assistance from France or commercial interests. He left Paris on the 14th of October 1919 in a Quadron G4 with his mechanic Jean Benoist. The Frenchman made it as far as Rangoon in Burma on the 8th of December 
before the Vimy overtook them. The Vimy was fitted with two Rolls-Royce Eagle engines, 360 horsepower, carrying 500 gallons of petrol and spare parts. The wingspan is 65 feet, the length 45 feet and the height 15 feet. Fully equipped, the machine weighed 12,000 pounds and could cruise at a speed of 95 miles per hour. The propeller blades could rotate at 1100 revolutions per minute. There was, however, no wireless radio. When asked about it later, Ross Smith replied, It would weigh 150 pounds and not be worth it. Unless we had the means of giving an absolutely accurate position, what would be the use of sending the SOS call and wasting people's time looking for us? The Vickers Vimy flight was not without incident, but the plane was better suited than most of the others to the challenges of such a long flight. The trip from England to France took the plane through cloud and snow. When it landed at Lyon, the plane was covered in ice and the instruments were frozen. At Pisa, they had to contend with an aerodrome flooded with 18 inches of water. Flying down the length of Italy, they were buffeted in a rainstorm, dropping hundreds of feet at a time in the turbulent atmosphere. There was a forced landing in the desert at Ramadi, again due to bad weather, but they were able to take off without incident. On the 30th of November, they overtook Captain Poulet over Burma and landed an hour before he did. Poulet attempted to leave Rangoon the same day as the Vimy, but fog closed in and fearful of becoming lost, he turned back to Rangoon. The next day, a burst tyre put pay to his attempt, and on the third try, he was well on his way to Bangkok, where the engine gave trouble and again he returned to the safety of Rangoon. A broken piston rod finally convinced the Frenchman to abandon his plans to fly to Australia. The final stages of the flight were considered the most perilous. From Rangoon to Singapore, the flight was a thousand miles over mostly jungle, where a forced landing could have proven lethal. Then the longest stretch of open ocean to be flown over was between Asia and Australia. At Singapore, anything not vital such as a photographic outfit they were carrying, was offloaded to lighten the plane. The Vickers Vimy Company had arranged for aerodromes to be created on Sumbawa, Flores and Timor, but the flight almost ended at Surabaya on Java. The landing field had recently been reclaimed, and one side of the plane sank in the mud until the wing was almost in it. It took them 12 hours to dig the plane out. If not for the assistance of about 200 Javans who laid out bamboo matting, which covered 300 yards to create a platform to take off, the machine would likely have stuck in the mud. Not everywhere were locals so happy to see the plane flying overhead. In Syria, Burma and Siam, some people who had never seen a plane before appeared to be in terror of it. The crew spent the night in Timor before the final 500 mile flight to Darwin, leaving at 8.30am on the 10th of December. At 1pm, HMAS Sydney, 180 miles out from Darwin, sighted the plane. The news was relayed and crowds began to gather at the landing field to await the aviators. The Vimy flew over the landing ground, one of the pilots waving to the people below, before circling and performing a perfect landing under sunny skies at 3.20pm. The actual flying time was 124 hours at an average of 85 miles per hour. The quarantine officer, Dr. Harris, examined the four men and then Lieutenant Hudson Fish officially greeted them on behalf of the Australian government. Fish had himself intended to compete in the race with a World War I air race called McGuinness, but a grazier who was to underwrite the venture died before signing the cheque. Instead, Fish and McGuinness were asked to survey the route from Darwin to Brisbane and assisted with placing supplies at depots across the north of Australia for the plains. Driving back from Darwin, Fish and McGuinness found a grazier whose vehicle was stuck in a dry creek bed. They stopped to help out the man, named Fergus McMaster. Later that year, Fish, McGuinness and McMaster started their own commercial airline, called Qantas. After speeches by the Governor and the Territory Administrator, the flyers were carried shoulder high to the house of the Governor of Darwin Jail for a reception. The only killjoy on the day seems to have been the customs officer, Mr Geraghty, who was insistent that the plane be checked for items for which duty had to be paid. The job's worth was told by Ross Smith. All they had on board were spare parts, some oil and petrol, pyjamas and clothes. Keith Smith added, and a tin of bully beef. The aviators agreed to check a list of items the next day. 
One of the mechanics was quoted as saying he'd not do the flight again for a hundred thousand pounds. It was no joyride. The engines went well, of course. We had to work practically every night at one thing or another. However, it's all right now. When news reached Adelaide that the plane had landed, the town hall bells rang out and flags were hoisted in celebration. As it was an extremely hot day in the city, with the temperature going above 109 degrees Fahrenheit, toasts to the crew of the Vimy were drunk eagerly. The race was seen by experts as important in determining the future viability of commercial aviation. The Mayor of Darwin hoped that in future international flights would use his town as the gateway to Australia. The Chinese government took interest, and as the Vimy neared its goal, they ordered a hundred similar planes for internal communications in their country. Plans for an airmail route between India and Egypt were made based on the route taken by the flight. The journey across Australia took twice as long with stops along the way. The Vimy departed from Darwin on the 13th of December, and some concern was raised when nothing was heard while the plane was forced down by a broken propeller near Anthony's Lagoon, 150 miles east of the nearest habitation, Newcastle Waters, in the far north of the Northern Territory. A hawk had flown into the propeller near Calcutta, India during the flight, and the wood had slowly split thereafter. It had been held together with wire, but in the 116 degree heat over the north of Australia, it finally cracked. Having effected repairs, they made Camo Wheel, where they were interviewed by the press, and then Cloncurry in Queensland by the 21st of December, on the weekend that Ross turned 29. Longreach was visited on the 22nd of December, and the following day Charleville hosted the Flyers. Along the way they dropped packets of air mail for the outback towns. Christmas was spent at Charleville while a problem with a crankshaft of the in engine was examined. It was decided the repairs could not be made in Charleville, and the engine was taken out of the plane and taken to Ipswich by train at New Year's 1920. One of the mechanics who worked on it was a Corporal Luxton of Ipswich, who had been Ross Smith's mechanic for a time in Egypt during the war. In all, the delay at Charleville was 52 days, longer than it took to fly halfway around the world. The departure for Burke in New South Wales took place on the 12th of February 1920. They stopped today and then flew to on to Narromine. Sydney was reached at last on the 14th of February. Amongst the celebrations, Wally Shears took the opportunity to marry his fiancée, Helena Alford, on the 17th of February, with Ross Smith as best man. They had been waiting five years for their nuptials, while Wally was away at the front and taking part in the great air race. Next stop was Melbourne, and the plane arrived and circled the city on the 25th of February. They had been due at Flemington Racecourse the day before, where during chaotic scenes a ten-year-old boy was accidentally run down. When they finally landed it was at Point Cook Army Base, in front of less than a hundred onlookers. When the Vimy reached Melbourne, the Vickers Company gifted it to the Australian Government to be displayed in the War Museum. The four men shared the prize money, the Smith brothers had been knighted, and the mechanics received bars to their military medals. Buttons featuring the likenesses of the Smith Brothers were being sold by the 15th of December in Adelaide to earn money for the French Red Cross as part of fundraising to help France in the wake of the Great War. The final stage of the flight was to Adelaide, the hometown of the Smith Brothers, who grew up at Semaphore. The plane arrived on the 22nd of March 1920, landing at what were open paddocks at Northfield. All eyes in Adelaide were turned to the sky to watch the Vimy fly over the southern suburbs, where they overflew Ross's friend Peter Waite's house at Urbray, before passing over the centre of the city at 1.55pm, and then the Smith home at Walkerville, and on to the landing field. The landing site is preserved in this reserve as suburbia has closed in just like the crowd of thousands surged around the plain long ago. Although South Australians wanted to retain the plane in Adelaide, it was flown back to Melbourne on the 5th of April, where it was to stay until 1925, when the War Museum was moved to Sydney. In April 1922, it was a major attraction at the Melbourne Royal Show, raising money for the National War Memorial Fund. At the same time in England, Sir Ross Smith and Lieutenant Bennett were testing a new Vickers Viking at Brooklands. Both were killed in the crash. Smith was 29 and Bennett was 28. 
The memorial statue was dedicated to Smith in December 1927 in the Cresswell Gardens near Adelaide Oval. The War Museum in Sydney closed in 1935 and the Vimy was moved to the Canberra War Memorial when it opened in 1941. Adelaide Airport opened in 1954 and in 1955 the Vimy was moved to its new location as the War Memorial was filled with World War II relics and space was at a premium. Sir Keith Smith died in Sydney in 1955, aged 64. Lieutenant Walter Shears was the only one of the four still alive and was present when the Adelaide Airport Memorial was dedicated on the 27th of April 1958. He died aged 79 in 1968. A new $6 million facility to house the Vimy is proposed to be built in 2021.